Welcome back to The Things We Know with myself, Lisa Callahan, and my pod partner in crime, Carrie Morin. We are back, as promised, with more hormone discussion with Dr. Krista Anderson Ross. And today, we're going to go in more specifically into two areas. Um, that we feel are sort of commonly brought up around menopause. We've even had some, I've had some people reach out to me and say, can you talk about this? So I'm really excited to move into this, which is sex and sleep. So Krista, thanks for being with us again. My <laughs> pleasure. Yes, thank you. Um, let's start with the subject of the ever elusive lack of sleep that so many women fret about. Lisa is very lucky. She doesn't. Um <laughs> And um, it, it is something like I am one of those people who's lucky I can fall asleep, no problem. But sometimes staying asleep is a challenge. And as long as I've known you, my friend, Krista, you've been passionate about educating people about understanding how sleep is the key to riding the hormone roller coaster, not just for women of a certain age, but for all humans. Like, you know, you've helped me with my son's level of sleep and with his comfort level, figuring out, you know, cortisol and melatonin and all that. So can you share more just about what you're, you've learned about and what women might not know that could be helpful? Absolutely. So what I like to say is we are mammals. We just are like, you know, like we're well-dressed mammal, um, with a, a, a cell phone in our hands, you know, um, and we think that somehow we can we, we, we did not receive a 2.0 update of our nervous system. We still have a primitive nervous system, even though we live in a modern world. And, we, and I, I touched on briefly last time that in, in one day's time, a modern human is going to experience as much stress, as many kind of stress hits in a day as a more primitive human would have experienced in their entire lifetime. So we have a lot of pulls on our circadian rhythm and anytime we're going to talk about sleep we also have to talk about the daytime and and how we manage our daytime mm. because there's so many aspects to the daytime that are going to impact sleep starting just with when you wake up in the morning the importance of being exposed to natural light and the reason for natural light, even if it's the cloudiest day of the year, the reason that the, the importance of natural light is because the natural light is going to suppress what little bit of melatonin you still are producing in the morning. And it's going to help to stimulate the production of cortisol. And the best time to get that light exposure is within 30 minutes of waking up in the morning, an hour, go for a little walk, sit outside and know not everybody has the ability to do this. So if that's the case, then an alternative would be a full spectrum light box that you can put on your desk or have in your kitchen while you're making your coffee or your breakfast. And that's going to provide that same kind of full spectrum light that's going to suppress your melatonin levels and support your cortisol levels. So getting natural light exposure is really important. And if you have a teenager and they're like, you know, they have a shifted rhythm. So they wake up later naturally and they go to bed later naturally, they become vampires as soon as they get hormones. <laughs> and, and so one of the things that you can do with them is you can have a, a little um, full spectrum light next to their bed, turn it on a half an hour before you're going to wake them up. So the retina can, can register light even when your eyes are closed. So mm -hmm. that light in the morning is, is so important. And, and sometimes it'll make a, a huge difference in for somebody who's having a hard time, you know, getting to sleep at night, someone who has insomnia, mm -hmm. onset insomnia. So other things about what we do during our day that are going to impact sleep are when certain things that happen during the day are signals. So when we eat is a signal, when we exercise is a signal, um, the, you know, the light is a signal. All these signals kind of add up to is it daytime, is it nighttime, at what point are we in the day? And some of the things that are going to interfere with sleep that we do during the day, coffee is a big one, right? Caffeine in general, any, any, and everybody's going to be a little bit, everyone's different in their sensitivity to it. So if someone is having coffee at two or three in the afternoon, there's a good chance it's going to interfere with their sleep. It may not interfere with their ability to fall asleep, but it may interfere with their quality of sleep. It would be, mm -hmm. it's got a pretty long half-life. So it would be unusual for late coffee drinking to not somehow impact one's sleep. 
Mm. On the opposite end of the spectrum is alcohol. Alcohol is going to, it takes about six hours to be metabolized. So while it's also, it's called a, um, a somnogen, so it helps us to fall asleep. But then when it wears off in about six, you know, four to six hours, depending on one's metabolism, there's a little cortisol spike and that could happen in the middle of the night and it might make your heart race and that's going to wake you up and it's really hard to get back to sleep after that. So- I am not familiar with that at all. I don't know what you're talking about, Krista. <laughs> the very bad thing about wine because we, we there's like this you know scientific phenomenon where women enjoy wine more and more and more as they get older <laughs> I think mm. it's related to, it's like an inverse relationship hormones in wine so it's really sad that that happens um I have can to I say. ask you a quick question about the natural light um yeah. I have floor to ceiling windows so is that enough I mean I do tend to get out a little bit but not within the first 30 minutes but I mean it is is that enough? And like, again, my daughter who's 17, she has floor to ceiling windows in her bedroom. So she does wake up to natural light. Is that enough? So it's it's certainly going to be enough to help wake you up. But it's my understanding that some of that natural light is attenuated by the window. And I can't remember how much, I don't think it's enough. It's really outside. It's being outside. Um, that is is so powerful or again that that full spectrum light but so the light box is bringing in like legitimate sort of same as if we were out in the side outside yeah it has to do with the length of the light rays which we can talk Ah. about which would be actually a, a valuable thing to talk about when we're discussing daytime and nighttime because one of the most suppressive um one of the most suppressive lights besides led to our to our body are, is, um, uh, the blue lights from technology. They're Uh, very, very suppressive to melatonin. And so, you know, our, as our day progresses and our cortisol levels go down, our melatonin levels start to go up right about sunset. As the light starts to decrease, the melatonin starts to increase. And if we're on a screen, if we're on, you know, looking at our phones, even if we're watching a movie or, you know, we're looking at television, that blue light is very suppressive to melatonin. Mm. And melatonin has so many benefits in the body. You know, we know that in the middle of the night, our body produces melatonin and we know it's going to impact every, pretty much every cell of the body, you know, every organ, every, you know, every bone, um, everything is going to be impacted your skin by every, every cell that you could think of is going to be impacted by melatonin. But what we're just now learning is this is only 5% of the melatonin production in our body. A lot of the melatonin that we produce comes from the mitochondria. It's, and it's a really important antioxidant for the mitochondria because the mitochondria is like the engine of our cell. And it also has the ability to produce pro oxidants. So it can, it can also um, create oxidation, which we associate with cancers, let's say. So how I, in what little I know about sleep research, I had always heard the sort of sense of two hours before you're going to go to sleep, you should have your screens off. Is that a good rule of thumb? Yes, it is. And another thing to avoid in that same two to three hour time frame is, and I would say at least an hour, you know, I, I, you know, our lives are crazy and busy, but I think that one hour makes a difference. I'm a big proponent of using melatonin Mm -hmm. because melatonin is associated with the dark. And if you have a dark deficiency in your light, you're in your life, then you're going to have sort of a lifelong deficiency of melatonin. So I believe that it needs to be repleted in the same way that, you know, vitamin D comes from the sun. And if you're having, if you're not getting the exposure to the sun, you can have an exposure to vitamin D and that needs to be repleted. So I, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm a strong advocate of melatonin. I've recently become a, more an advocate of an herbal melatonin versus a, um, a synthetic melatonin because they can add a lot of junk to those synthetic melatonins that you get at you know, Costco or wherever you get. Yeah. And they've done all these different, like Consumer Reports has done these evaluations of what's in the melatonin that you get over the counter. And it can be, 10 times the, the amount, you know, the milligram dosage that you think you're getting, or it can be one tenth the milligram dosage that you think that you're getting. So hmm. I like the herbal concept because um, our bodies are then converting it into melatonin. Melatonin, uh, go ahead. 
No, no, go ahead. I'll, 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 I'll save it. <laughs> well, I was going to say that, you know, I think it's really fascinating to know that melatonin is on the serotonin pathway. So yeah. serotonin converts into melatonin. So we don't have melatonin if we don't have serotonin. And where do we produce most of our serotonin in our gut? Mm. It's really in our gut. So yeah, you, you described this one so beautifully, like a seesaw. Can you, you know, about the serotonin and the melatonin, like the, the, the more you can like pay attention to your body's production of melatonin, the more you're going to be happier during the day. And the more you're like taking care of your gut and producing, so you, you're going to have to correct me probably. Um, and you know, um, promoting serotonin, the better you're going to sleep like that, that they need to seesaw opposite. Am, am I wrong about that? Did you say yeah, something like that to me? That's how I remembered it. <laughs> yeah. So that's, so I just actually, I'm learning something new right now about serotonin that I didn't know, but I think it explains a lot of it. Um, there's when, when, so serotonin can actually speak to the, the pineal, the super nucleus, which is the, um, the master, you know, a timing coordinator of our, our whole body. So serotonin can talk to a part of the brain that can then talk to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So certainly a, a happy gut is going to, it's going to contribute to a happier circadian rhythm. I think maybe what you're thinking of in terms of the seesaw is the cortisol versus melatonin. Oh, okay. So okay. when cortisol um, comes on board in the morning, melatonin is going down. And then as the day progresses, cortisol is a big spike in the morning and then it comes down. And then when we're getting ready, you know, for bed or what's called the dim light melatonin on, onset, which happens naturally right about the time that the sun set, that's when our melatonin levels start to increase. And so we need darkness. We need complete darkness to get that spike of melatonin and suppress the cortisol levels. Same as in the morning, we need that bright light to suppress melatonin and support cortisol levels. So it is a seesaw. And if that okay. morning cortisol level doesn't get where it's supposed to be, then that that nighttime melatonin level is not going to get to where it's supposed to be either. Interesting. I have a question too, but I'm thinking about my boys and melatonin, both of them for a long time would either t do the tart cherry juice, the pure tart cherry juice for the melatonin properties, or, you know, just some some melatonin, right? Whether, I don't know whether we got it from Trader Joe's or I got it through you. <laughs> um, and then at some point, Peter was like, my oldest, you know, the same way he is about caffeine. Like, I don't know. I feel like I'm too dependent on it. I shouldn't. And listening to you, I feel like if it's a really good source that he shouldn't worry about that, that there's not like a, I can't sleep without it kind of, that was his worry is like, I got to figure out how to have good sleep without taking melatonin. There's a lot of, um, uh, misinformation on the internet about melatonin use being suppressive to melatonin production. And it's just not true because it has a very short half-life. It's only okay. 45 to 60 minutes that it's active in the body. So that's not a long enough half-life to be able to suppress our body's production of melatonin. Having said that, there is, I don't really like to give melatonin to kids unless it's required because we don't, because in our lifetime, the highest amounts of melatonin that we're producing are is when we're a child. And right before we go through puberty, there's a dip in melatonin. And so there's some research. So there's been some, there's been a question based on animal studies as to whether or not that dip in melatonin is important for puberty to take place. Mm. And there has been not good research and we just had a study that came out in 2023 that showed us that young men with a delay in puberty have higher melatonin levels than young men who had normal onset of puberty. Hmm. Okay. So, so that's the question is like, so their melatonin levels are still kind of high. They haven't done their little dip yet. So we don't want to supplement melatonin in a pre-pubertal kid or even a peripubertal kid um, because we don't want to in any way interfere with that onset of puberty in case that little drop is required. So getting back to, to Peter, our body produces about 0.3 milligrams naturally of melatonin every night. That's a tiny, tiny amount. 
most of the products that you're going to find over the counter are three milligrams and up. Now, it is a, it is, it, it, melatonin is a signal as opposed to something that's going to make you sleepy. It mm. signals your body to say, hey, it's past, it's past sunset. And that must mean it's time for bed. It's time for the sleeping period, the regenerative, you know, sleeping period. So that's really what melatonin does. Research shows that those lower dosages of melatonin are as effective or more than the higher dosages. Mm. Um, there are different neurological diseases, cancer, things like that, and, and even viral um, processes where we're realizing that high doses of melatonin can have very therapeutic effects because of their antioxidant and anti-inflammation properties. But in terms of using it for one's sleep, one can take a very low dosage. And yes, nice. as you said, Carrie, quality is important. And there's two different forms. You can take fast acting or you can take um, the sustained release formula. So fast acting is going to give you that signal to, to, you know, it's time for bed, it's time to get ready for sleep. And the sustained release is going to hopefully prevent that middle of the night waking that a lot of people experience, regardless of their hormonal status and their age. A, a lot of people experience that middle of the night waking and they can't get back to sleep. So it's this gene release melatonin might help with that. That's, that's a great segue into a question that we had um, about, you know, menopausal women have, like reporting for the first time in their lives when they reach these perimenopause years often, maybe before that, because I think I, I think new moms have a lot of like night sweats and stuff too, and, and wakefulness, obviously. But um, like just how to attack the difference between having trouble falling asleep, I have no trouble with that, um, or staying asleep. Like once your bladder wakes you up or once your stress wakes, you know, what, you know, once your hormones wake you up. So definitely, you know, ruling out, you know, the things that we've already talked about, the light exposure, when are you mm -hmm. drinking coffee? If you're really sensitive to coffee, then you might need to have some L-theanine with it. L-theanine is an amino acid that can help to attenuate the excitatory effects of caffeine. So um, if you're really, or, or just do what I do and drink decaf, which mm -hmm. is delicious. I get high quality decaf. I brew it like everybody else and it's really good. And I still get a tiny bit of caffeine and that's enough. Um, and then the alcohol is somebody drinking alcohol. So here's the thing that happens so much with women that we are more sensitive to temperature fluctuation as our hormones shift. And so melatonin as it rises is going to decrease our body temperature naturally to help prepare us for sleep. So if the lights are on and you're drinking wine and you're making dinner and you're having, like you're acting just the way you would be acting at three o'clock in the afternoon and it's, it's seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night, it's gonna, you're going to push that melatonin onset off that much further. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, turning down your lights is really important to do in your house after um, sunset. My, my family thinks I'm insane. My husband will walk into a room like, I can't say no, but your eyes will just. <laughs> well, Brendan does that naturally and I get really annoyed. So I'm going to have to thank him. And I yeah. am, compl I, that is so interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking a lot of maybe why I don't have some of these issues is this is, I sit, I love sitting in the dark. I, you do. I, you I sit in the dark and listen to music. Now my husband might have the TV on. There's a lot of things I'm going to share when I get off this recording with him, but you know, yeah, some of those things and I will, and there's a point where I just move into the bedroom. And now the one thing I'm not, that I don't do is complete dark because we leave our blinds open because we have this gorgeous view of downtown LA. So I don't have complete dark, but yeah, I mean, the rest of it, I already do intuitively. So that, that you, can really wear, you can wear an eye mask. I, I do I, have an eye mask. Yeah. And, and you know, I had a, I had a life-changing experience recently. I've been wearing an eye mask for 10 plus years because I like the light in the morning. And so I'm yeah. willing to put up with a lighter room. So I, I'm like, Oh no, no big whoop. I use my eye mask and I switched my eye mask recently to something that is like that you can adjust the cups around your eyes and once I switched to this new eye mask my sleep has improved by like 60 percent it is the oh. weirdest thing as someone who's been wearing an eye mask for years so just enough light was creeping in to interfere uh. with my sleep mm. so interesting. yeah so it's we're so sensitive to it even when our like I said even when our eyes are closed so Wow. So, so incandescent lights are the old fashioned, you know, 
light bulbs before we got LEDs. And, and you can use those in the evening. You can use orange lights in the evening that are, you know, more, um, less stimulatory. Um, and, you know, you can take a little melatonin, you can take a hot bath, which seems counterintuitive, but the bath um, causes vasodilation of your vessels. And then you get out of the bath and the air is always cooler than the bath. So then you have a vasoconstriction and that cools you down. Nice. So um, some kind of a hydrotherapy, whether it's a bath or shower before bed can help um, with women who are experiencing heat or having a hard time falling asleep. Um, I've also heard not to eat much before two hours before right. going to bed that. because yeah. that also like heats your body up. Mm. Exactly. Cause it interferes with that production of melatonin and melatonin interferes with our body's ability to digest that food. And we really need an empty system when we're sleeping because it's when we're sleeping that all of this repair is taking place via right. our, um, immune system. And, you know, I, I, there's these wonderful graphs I wish I could show you, maybe I can show you another time that shows you when someone is asleep during the sleep period, how their immune system is doing all these beautiful, amazing, wonderful things like washing out the brain and, and um, you know, keeping the cytokines low, which are the inflammatory um, aspects of the immune system. And then when someone is awake, during the sleep period, how that stuff's not going on at the same degree. It might be happening a little bit, but not a lot. And mm -hmm. they even showed, and it has to do with that spike of melatonin in the middle of the night. And they even showed a graph that showed if someone, someone might have like two little wimpy, um, you know, increases of melatonin throughout the night and that doesn't do it either. So it's mm -hmm. that darkness that stimulates that melatonin that is so important for resetting our brains. Wow. So good. I feel compelled to want to sing a salt and pepper song now. Let's talk about sex. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to sing, but that's what I want to sing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I think it's impossible to talk about hormonal changes without talking about it because I'm curious. Uh, I, I think it's important to talk about some of the things you already talked about, right? Like how our sexual health is just such a big like so affected by these years of perimenopause and menopause, but also just parenting is, um, but stress is like, it, you know, all of that. But I, I want to address libido because I think it's very common and, and I've definitely experienced that in my hormonal journey, like low libido. Um, but I know like it's, it's, it's a, like, you know, it's, it's like, um, teenage males, you know, like, I think it can also go really high. And, and I think the important thing that we're noticing is a lot of people are noticing they are not at the same level as their partner, whether it's higher or lower. Um, so I just, I, I'm wondering if you can enlighten us a little bit or, you know, just help us kind of think about that a little bit too. Absolutely. Well, let's start, let's just start talking about men a little bit first. So okay. Men definitely, ex well, first of all, let, let's start from the, the basis that we outlive our design from a, mm. from a mammal standpoint. Okay. So let's just start there and give everybody a break <laughs> in terms oh, of reproduction and, and, and what that act is really designed for. Okay. Having said that, it is a great measure of one's vitality, one's, your, your interest in in you know sexual activity is a great sort of uh, barometer of your vitality, mm. and if someone is like yeah nah, then 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 there's a there's there's a vitality lapse somewhere, right? And so where is that? Um, so as our as women's hormones are changing throughout time, men's hormones are changing too, and their testosterone levels are absolutely dropping over time. Not like you know dumping, but they're 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 you know, gradually decreasing over time. That's natural. That's normal. It's worse for men who have more weight around their middle because that is an estrogen factory. Mm. But as we were talking about, testosterone can convert into estrogen in men and women. And so if there's a lot of fat around the middle, then that testosterone is converting into estrogen. And sometimes you'll see in men that they'll start to form um, breasts and a, like little, a little, little bit of breast tissue. And that's because there's too much estrogen and it's usually related to fatty tissue. So reducing that fatty tissue is going to reduce that kind of hyperestrogenization and that you'll see sometimes in men. But some of the things that are really going to help men with their testosterone levels, um, one of the best things is muscle building. So um, 
any kind of weight training where there's mus muscle being built is going to actually impact positively testosterone levels. Now, if you start that at 50, is, is it going, are you going to be able to catch up with a guy who's been doing muscle, you know, um, uh, weight training for 20 years? No, but, but you can improve it. Um, and so, and there's also herbs and things that, that men can use to try to help to, and, and we haven't even talked about herbs for women. Um, mm -hmm. there's plenty of herbs that women can use if they don't want to use hormones. So I'm not a, a hormone only person, um, but, but getting back to libido and men. So a lot of men, you know, who lose their libido will go on testosterone mm. and they'll find that that makes a big difference in their vitality and their energy and their mood, just the way a woman is going to feel differently when you're replacing the hormones that she's not producing anymore. And it, and it has great benefit to them in the long run as well, but all the same, you know, benefits that women have. Yeah. So, so I, I, it's, I, I think that people forget that, 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 that men's, you know, hormones are shifting too. It's called andropause. And, you know, sometimes it's called menopause. <laughs> um, and so like, we have to give them that, right? And then also like, so, you know, what is it that they need to, to be supported? And always I'm gonna start with that circadian rhythm, right? If they're mm. staying up till two in the morning, you know, listening to music or watching scary movies, there it's gonna impact the whole thing, you know? So that, you know, getting that whole circadian rhythm regulated could make a difference. And then, to talk about women in, and, and how, you know, that, that libido can shift. I think that that, you know, whatever it is, it's going to bring that vitality back. And Carrie, you made a really good point in talking about, yeah, raising children. I mean, boom, uh, it's, it, 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 it takes so much out of us. Right. And, 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 you know, our generation has been really serious about raising children. We're not like our parents who like, just let us, you know, free range. We were free range children, <laughs> right? That what do they call it? Benign neglect. Mm -hmm. That's not how we're raising our children, right? We are like full on twenty four seven, like full contact sport. Parents, <laughs> would you say? I said full contact sport. Full contact parenting, absolutely. And and yeah. and that takes a lot out of us. And you know, how do we replenish our tank? And I I would say that you know, in my work with women one of the most important things is that I will tell them is we need to read, how do we refill your tank? What refilled your tank? Cause it's going to be a little bit different for each person. Very often I recommend being alone, mm. having some alone time to get in touch with yourself. Who are you? Who are you? Do you mm. even know, you know, can you define yourself outside of your children, your mm. family and your work? Mm. Who are you outside of those things? And that's really important. And I, and I think that that you know, I think oftentimes women need, when they hit this point in their life, and I say this because I'm one of them, they need, what is that thing that's going to spark their joy? You know, what is the thing that's going to reignite that spark for them? You know, it could be sex. So if that's it, then, then how are we going to get you to that place? So again, the circadian rhythm, we're going to, we're going to want to optimize that cortisol picture, we're going to look at thyroid, right? Because thyroid is your metabolism. Sometimes women aren't comfortable with their bodies. It's like, there's so many parts to it, right? I mean, the psychological parts are just as important as the physiological parts, right? Now, the physio physiological parts are dryness. That's a big one for women. Mm -hmm. You know, as their hormones start to wane, and it can happen in their 30s. I've seen it. As their hormones start to wane, that dryness can make for less comfortable sex. So, Carrie, I, I always quote you um, that the coconut oil, you know, it belongs in the kitchen and the and in the bedroom, right? And the bathroom, yeah, kitchen, yeah. bedroom, and bathroom for your that's skin. Right. That's right. Yeah, I love that quote, <laughs> and and I completely agree with that. It's like you know, gosh, yeah. What what is it that you're going to need to make it more comfortable? And Carrie, you're also somebody who has been a great proponent of vibrators for women. And, mm -hmm. and I think you were the one who told me that vibrators were a medical device mm -hmm. Way back at the turn of the 20th century. And I think it's really important to remember because that is increasing the vitality of those tissues. That is mm -hmm. a massage, a local massage that is, you know, vasodilating and it's going to bring good stuff to those tissues that mm -hmm. might be vasoconstricted. 
Yeah, I think if this story is correct, that it was about like helping women with um, mental health, like they like insanity, which is hilarious and and true. I was gonna say, I mean, <laughs> that tracks. That's where, that, hysterical. That's where his right that's hysterical. Where yes, came from right, right. So yeah. I I love thinking about you know all the things that you know, we, that we can add back in, you know, that self-pleasure is also like, how are you get, get, get back in touch with yourself? Who are you? You know, I just, I, I love what you said so much. And I'm, I can feel Lisa feeling the same thing because that's what we do as coaches, right? Like, who are you? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you may be confident in your job. You may be confident as a mother. Good for you. <laughs> um, you know, you may, but like confidence and self-esteem are very different things. And it's really hard to get to a place of who am I when I'm not doing anything or serving anybody like, and that is a big piece of reconnecting to vitality that people overlook. They come to a doctor, a naturopathic coach or someone like, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And it's like, no, you tell us who you are and what lights you up. And a lot of these things are going to start to work together to support you, right? And so I love that you said that because I, I think that that's recent in like last decade for people to understand the power of the mind-body connection and 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 to be back in their body. I think we've just learned as a culture to abandon our bodies. We don't trust it, whether it's because of abuse or or just conditioning. We don't, and then we live in our heads and we believe everything we read and hear, and we never really drop in and go, oh, like what what feels good for me? Who am I? So I love that you said that. Well, and I think that's so well put. And and what we're realizing, you know, that the science is now backing up what we all know. We all know intuitively that we need rest. And I'm not talking about sleep. I'm talking about rest. Our brain needs to rest. We need to release ourselves from the anxiety of the future. We need to release ourselves of the depression of the past and just be in the moment. And this research that I'm doing for this presentation that I'm giving on Saturday, there's what I, what I learned is while there is a bypass of the circadian system, stress can bypass the entire circadian system and just go, right to stress hormones and it's gonna impact the circadian system. Another thing that can bypass the circadian system is, is um, uh, the vagus nerve. You know, stimulating and supporting the vagus nerve in a healthy way can also can bypass the stress system and it can lead to a better, you know, a more parasympathetic rest and digest state. And how do we do that? We do that through rest. We do it through breathing. We do it through visualizing. We do it through meditation, through yoga, through gratitude, walking outside in nature, forest bathing in the woods, taking our shoes off and walking on the grass. All of those things are going to bring us to the present moment. And you know, research shows that a couple minutes a day of letting go of the past and the future and your to-do list and just being present has so much benefit to that circadian rhythm slash stress system mm. it it just neutralizes it i feel like i, I want to sing hallelujah i like angels should go oh. so true <laughs> and i want to stress it doesn't because i'm you know i i think about uh clients uh, that i've had you know that are go 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 and the idea of stopping could be like i can't do that it doesn't have to be 15 minutes of meditation just a couple of minutes you know we as coaches we learn and, and teach the 557 breath that does move you from sympathetic to parasympathetic ideally you do that 10 times which is two minutes you i feel it after three times like yeah. three times mm -hmm. it does not have to be this big production to move you into the parasympathetic nervous system right. Right. And, it, mm. it, you know, we have research that shows us that five minutes on, and I hate to, you know, say this, but this is a great way, actually, it can also be a great way to put you into a parasympathetic state if you're using it properly. So there are these wonderful apps right. that, you know, can lead us through a guided meditation and, and help us to get there. And I, I you know, I, um, there's research that shows us that an hour of transcendental meditation with your own special mantra and, you know, two or three minutes on your app, you know, you're with doing guided meditation or meditation that it is, it is as effective 
in you know the the, the markers that they're measuring, um, you know, blood pressure and cortisol production as you know, a couple hours of TCM mm. right? meditation, right? Is that it? TCM? TM. Yeah. TM. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, uh, you know, you, you two know this. I don't know if I've, if I've ever shared this here. Griffin has a vagus nerve stimulator to help disrupt, um, potential, um, an onset of, uh, seizures, but I learned that it is being very, um, helpful in treating anxiety and depression and helping with hormone like imbalances, um, for people who are having that, that's a surgical insertion. So I guess you'd probably <laughs> Have, need to have a great reason to do it, like a, a real imbalance, but it helped me understand and learn even way more about the vagus nerve than I ever had before. And, and I think you're the one who sent us to a functional neurologist who had us doing a lot of vagus nerve exercises. And you're right. We have access to so much. And just for um, those, for people who don't know what the vagus nerve is or where that is, what, what, do you have something that you've shared with Carrie that you can share quickly with our listeners? Well, it's, it's, it's the nerve that is going to be activated when you're in a rest and digest situation. And it can be stimulated um, by, you know, deep breathing and any kind of relaxing um, activity. And when you don't have that relaxing activity in your life or the deep breathing or the meditation or whatever those things are, then you would, you're going to be more likely to be in a more Para, a more sympathetic state. So the vagus nerve is going to feed into this, the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest nervous system, where um, when you don't have the opportunity to um, stimulate or activate your parasympathetic nervous system, you're more likely to be in a sympathetic overdrive. And that's when you're going to be, you know, you're not going to have digest as well as you should. You're not going to sleep as well as you should. You're not going to be interested in sex. You're, everything that's shut, everything gets shut down. That's not required for survival. Right. So yeah. it, yeah. I always thought of it like from your throat to your anus <laughs> is the kind of where it runs, right? Yeah. Cause like swallowing um, can really help somebody who's constipated and, you know, so like you yeah. can activate it with gurgling. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Gargling is, is one of the things that I always remember that, like that you can activate your, 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 um, ah, vagus nerve by gargling. And there's lots of other little things that you can do too, but certainly all of these things that we're talking about are also going to play a role there. So cool. This is so cool. Um, just, just to go backwards for a second, because this is cracking me up and I don't know if you'll agree, but I don't know who, I, I feel like I saw a famous person joking about this, but that we sort of touched on it today when you were saying like men go through menopause and they start to produce estrogen and women, you know, we, we might, we have this imbalance that might highlight testosterone. And somebody said like, are basically women becoming men and men becoming women? Because I had this experience with my dad as he got older and I'm kind of having it with Brendan now is like their access to more emotion to more, you know, like being teary and sappy increases. And we're just like, ah, you're fine. Like we're, we're getting a lot less, responsive and sensitive to our kids that we need to. And, and like the examples of that are hilarious. It's like women are becoming men, men are becoming women. Is that even true? Or am I just enjoying that um, a little too much? <laughs> well, you know, I, I love that. And I, and I do think that there is some truth to that just in terms of how far we live, how long we live and how our modern life is going to feminize women and potentially, sorry, feminize men and masculinize women. Not, and not that that's a bad thing, um, but it is a bad thing if it has negative physiological effects, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that getting back to that Crohn concept, I think that, you know, our job at this point in our life, you know, when you think about it sort of from a mammal perspective, once again, it's like, we are going to be I have this, I have this weird um, theory that I've never seen corroborated anywhere else. So it's just me, my weird <laughs> thing is that one of the reasons that, that women after they go through menopause, wake up in the middle of the night is be to, because they are now available from a mammal perspective to care for their children's children. <laughs> and, you know, and so then your children would be, so your grandchildren. Right. So 
that that you know and that you're that they're up in the middle of the night you're up in the middle of the night like I said no, nothing corroborates this that I've ever seen but in terms of thinking about you know women in going through that that crone phase I do think that there is a point where you are you have so much wisdom and you've seen so much and you have so much experience that you know that you don't need to nurture everybody along anymore they got to figure it out now you know I, like I really do. I, do you think that oh my god i love it so much and i i have to say i i was uh, in prep for this and knowing that we we're going to talk about the crown i just want to present a friend of ours uh last year um through a croning and it was on the full moon after her birthday. And I did, I, I interestingly wasn't invited, but my husband was, cause he, she was sort of more of his friend and he went and it was at the full moon at midnight. There was about 30 people there. He said, there wasn't really a lot of ceremony, although there was a little bit, but her whole point was, you know what? I'm moving into this amazing part of my life and I want to celebrate it, you know, and, and I I've known this woman for years. She's amazing. Um, it, it was so in alignment when I heard she was throwing this, but Darren went and he said it was really cool, you know? And so I just, I, that's immediately what I thought of when I thought about this today. And so I was asking him about it again last night and he was like, yeah. yeah. And there were men and women there, but I just think that's a really awesome thing to, and and again, kind of the whole point of this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Own the fact that we are not dried up little old women when we hit our 40s, 50s, 60s. The, we have some guests coming down the pike that are in their 70s and 80s doing amazing things. And so this idea that life is over when we turn, when we crone is insane. And mm -hmm. I am so, so happy that you were on here to um, back us up on that scientifically. <laughs> I love it. I feel like this is a perf perfect circle back to these crone years and all the wisdom and vitality that we finally have time to embrace and expand into. And although we could talk a lot and may need to bring you back to talk about stress and rest and relaxation, because that was such an important point. Um, what would you, I feel like you've already done this, so thank you, but what would you like all women, not just the ones who've arrived into menopause, but those who are kind of dreading it, what would you like them to know or think about, or even like have hope about? I think that the message is balance versus imbalance, right? There's, you can always come back into balance. Mm. So what you're experiencing, you know, is kind of a, this too shall pass kind of a thing. This is not you for the rest of your life. And I think people are really quick to say, okay, I'm old now, I, you know, what this thing, this is just how it's going to be. I hear so many people saying that all the time about, well, I guess this is how it's going to be. Now that I'm 50, this is what I have to look forward to. And I don't, I just don't accept that. Right. And so at any phase of life, there is always, you can always bring balance back to your life. It takes effort. Mm. It doesn't happen without effort. Like no person that you look at who has balance in their life <laughs> has gotten there without working at it. Really good point. So good. Uh, so I think Carrie prepped you that we invite all of our guests to share their favorite song and the lyrics that speak to you. So what is yours, Krista? So mine is a song by Colin Hay, who was the lead Colin Hay. singer for um, Men, Men at Work. work. Mm -hmm. Yep. My one of my very first rock and roll crushes was Colin Hay when I oh, was 13 I years old. Oh, you know, I just saw him in concert a couple of weeks ago. Here he's still ben. amazing. Yeah, he's amazing. he still sounds so he's, good. His voice hasn't changed at all. No, been. I know. It's amazing. And this is one of his solo um, pieces that he did a few years ago. And I happened upon it. And so much about that song, it just, it's very soulful to me. Like so many songs, it doesn't really, it's funny. It's not really about the lyrics. It's really about how it makes me feel. And this song, I don't know, there's something about the song. I just listen to it over and over again. I turn it up really loud. I think it, but interesting about the song is, um, um, oh, Carrie, you're going to, I I sent you the lyrics. I don't, I, I what I, what I remember is ugh, beginning something about looking out on the horizon, um, being on the bow of a boat mm, and yes, kind of looking out at, um, Oh, I'll keep checking the horizon. I'll stand on the bow, feel the waves come crashing, come crashing down, down, down on me. 
Yeah. And, and yeah. you say, be still my love, open up your heart, let the light shine in. But don't you understand? I already have a plan. I'm waiting for my real life to begin. Oh. Right. I mean, it just says so much to me. It's like, it's talking about liminal space. It's talking about in between time. It's talking about not really knowing what's coming next, but it's okay. You know, I'm here. I'm waiting. It's all right. I'm okay with where I'm at. You know, um, the, the waves are crashing down, but I know they're not going to be crashing down forever. So again, like I said, it's really more how it makes me feel, but the lyrics also, you know, when I went back and it was like, how, how can I justify this song? I was like, oh, wow, actually there's probably a lot of subliminal messages that I was receiving that I didn't even realize. It's, it's just so perfect. perfect. It, it is perfect. And it's funny. He in general, um, you know, the song, um, oh my God, uh, f- from back in the day, it, he sang a lot about anxiety and, you know, we thought of him as just being, you know, the Australian, but his lyrics are phenomenal. So I love that you picked him. Hmm. And, and, it, and like always this, this will be added to the things we know podcast playlist on Spotify. Yeah. Yay. Thank you so much. All right. Well, Krista again, oh my gosh, we will definitely have you back. Cause I feel like we only just scratched the surface, but thank yeah. you for sharing so much of your wisdom with us. Um, we will, it brought re- relatability. It was easy to understand to me. This is going to be bookmarked and, and brought back to with every little symptom, <laughs> every little thing that I go through. Um, I love talking about the crone phase and realizing that this is in fact the best time of our life. So I'm so, so happy. Um, can you tell our listeners a little bit more how to learn from you and these topics if they're curious? I know you said as you uh, expand, you'll let us know so we can promote it, but what can they now listen to now? Yeah, so um, probably the best way to reach me is on my website, which is drkristand.com, drkristand.com. And um, I will be, that will be getting updated um, over the next couple months. And I'll be hopefully doing some classes, maybe starting maybe as soon as August. Ooh. Just a little simple, m- mostly I want to do Q&A like we've been mm-hmm. doing here, because I feel like that's really, you know, where the rubber meets the road in terms of um, meeting people's needs um, and, and really creating an interesting conversation. So like I'll speak for 15 or 20 minutes, get people thinking about a few topics and then we'll just go right into Q and A. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Awesome. And we will, we will also share those links here when this, um, when this airs. So great. Um, thank you so much, my friend. I just love you. I always learn so much from you. I (sighs) always learn so much from you too. (laughs) So that is it for this week's episode. And if you want to learn more from Krista's vast knowledge, like I said, we're going to share the links and um, her, any articles and info in our show notes and um, in our bio on both of our social media pages that are called the Things We Know podcast on um, Facebook and Instagram. Um, join us there and comment on any of this week's posts if you learned something new or if you're hungry for more episodes on hormones in the future. And as always, if this episode uh, resonated with you or anybody that you think you know going through any of this, which is essentially a human, <laughs> please mm-hmm. consider sharing this. It's We talked a lot about men issues, so please share this with your husbands and your brothers and your best friends and all those people, because um, we want to grow this audience for you and for just humanity in general. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We will be back next week. So long.